right, good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Ewald, and I serve the Texas Tribune as Senior Director of Events and Live Journalism. Welcome to those joining us here in San Antonio and those joining us online for our opening keynote conversation of our Future of Rural Texas Symposium, titled Rural Texas and the 89th Legislature. We'll welcome our panel to the stage in just a couple minutes. First, uh, thank you to all those around the state who make the journalism of the Tribune, including events like this, possible by becoming Texas Tribune members. To learn more and to become a member, just hit the donate button on the home page. If you become a Texas Tribune member during this symposium, you'll be entered to win a pair of Petite Paloma heirloom boots. You can see some of those boots outside in the lobby. You can learn more about chat, um, more by chatting with our membership manager and my colleague, Emily Yazetti, at the membership table in the lobby or by going online at texastribune.org slash boots hyphen prize. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment uh, as our symposium kicks off here to acknowledge the many sponsors that have made this symposium possible. Our presenting sponsor for the symposium is Texas Rural Funders. Our major sponsors are Methodist Healthcare Ministries, Texas Association of Dairymen, Texas Agricultural Council, the Commit Partnership, Water Grows, Lone Star Economic Alliance, Raise Your Hand Texas, Texas State Technical College, Texas A&M Health's Rural Engagement Program, Texas Cattle Feeders Association, and PepsiCo. Our supporting sponsors are Texas Agricultural Cooperative Council, Texas Forestry Association, Texas Poultry Federation, Texas Citrus Mutual, Texas Pecan Growers Association, Capital Farm Credit, Texas Corn Producers, Texas Nursery and Landscape Association, 1953 Tequila, Beer Alliance of Texas, William Chris Vineyards, Texas Association of Mid-Sized Schools, Texas Pork Producers Association, Texas Farm Bureau, University of Texas Press, Texas Agricultural Land Trust, UTSA's College for Health, Community, and Policy, Petite Paloma, and Texas Southwest SBDC Network. Thank you to our sponsors. <laughs> Do you also want to thank our media sponsors, Texas Public Radio, Fredericksburg Standard Radio Post, and Texas Country Reporter. And the corporate sponsors and donors underwrite at this event, they don't play a role in determining the content, speakers, or line of questioning. Finally, we want to thank the team at University of Texas at San Antonio for their incredible support in hosting us for this symposium. UTSA President Taylor Amy will greet us tomorrow morning, but here to offer a quick welcome on behalf of the university is Rod McSherry, Associate Vice President, Innovation and Economic Development, Nevada's Institute for Economic Development at UTSA. Rod? Thank you. Hi, good evening. I, I heard you said it was a quick welcome, so thank you and welcome, but no. Um, no, actually, thank you for joining us this evening. And as you said, uh, my president, uh, Taylor Amy, will be here tomorrow to, uh, to welcome you officially to the university. But welcome to the downtown campus. And my office is just across the quad here. Uh, I get the pleasure of running the Institute for Economic Development. And so here in the seventh largest city in the United States, the largest small town you will ever visit in San Antonio, we have reach across 79 counties, uh, starting in El Paso, going up to San Angelo, over to Austin, to Victoria, down to Corpus, and everything down to the border. So look at those counties that are, that are urban and look at those counties that are rural, and, and you can see very quickly that we are serving a huge territory of, of rural population. Uh, so thanks again for being here, and thanks for the trip for, for focusing on the, the future of rural Texas, because uh, I grew up in a rural county so far west Texas that you call it New Mexico, um, <clears throat> but El Paso was our center of gravity. And so in fact, I'm the border county, uh, so El Paso the, the, over there in the mountain time zone. We have a lot of the same issues and concerns of any rural county across the Southwest. And being from an agricultural economy, we were very tied to the likes of Hereford and Dimmit and those uh, stockyards up there. So the Texas economy really influences a lot more than just, just Texas, as you know. And then of course, looking south, we have the influence across the border. So we at the Institute for Economic Development are very interested in what happens 
east, west, north, south in rural Texas because the, uh, as the economies in North Texas with the foreign direct investment are increasing, what is that going to mean for us? Who's going to be the workforce? Who's going to be the innovator for that engine? So uh, I'm really thrilled that, that you all are here. Uh, of course, we're here on the eve of the opening of the, the next legislative session, which is going to be very ex exciting for all of us. Uh, and here at UTSA, we have a commitment to uh, talent production, which is the student production, which is your future workforce, the innovation, which is the research and the knowledge and the entrepreneurship, which is going to fuel uh, the next generation of inventors and inventions, but also taking all of that and putting it into practice in the place is really what matters. And so at my institute, I think we have the best of those three, of the talent, innovation, and place. We are the ones who get to... Um, to build the businesses, and uh, over the last year, we've, we've built a few businesses. We had about 40,000 businesses come through our doors. Collectively, our impact was about $2.6 billion in our area. So um, that's what we're doing for Southwest and South Central Texas, and uh, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for the opportunity to welcome you. You'll be welcomed officially uh, and formally by my boss tomorrow, but thank you, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you so much, Rod. Uh, here to offer a formal welcome on behalf of the Texas Tribune is our moderator for tonight's program and the Texas Tribune's editor-in-chief, Matthew Watkins. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here um, and for this two-day event on rural Texas and the issues coming up in the Texas legislative session. Um, I am Matthew Watkins. I'm the new editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. I've, I've been in my position for uh, coming up on around two months, and I'm very excited to be here. And I'm very excited about the Tribune's kind of ongoing and growing commitment to rural Texas. Um, as many of you know, of course, we have in, uh, in recent years built out what we call our regional team, where we have placed reporters uh, throughout the state in areas outside of you know, the Texas Triangle, places like uh, Lubbock, like um, the Permian Basin, like East Texas, and most recently the Rio Grande Valley. And you know, it is the job of that team to tell the story of Texas outside this area. A story, you know, with a population that rivals some of the biggest states in the, um, in the country in and of itself. Um, a story of a place where even for the people who don't live there, what happens there matters because it affects the food that people eat. It affects the water that they drink. It affects if and how they will get power to heat their homes and, 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 and do all those sorts of things. And, and so we really are at the Tribune committed with this event and with our reporting to telling that story, to highlighting and um, talking about the issues that affect rural Texas because it affects everyone, even our readers in, in the big cities and, and beyond. So it's, it's a real great pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk about the upcoming session here on our, our next panel. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I know that uh, hopefully everyone will learn a lot and that we will all learn um, something from you uh, during the course of this event. Um, we're going to go to our panel right now. And as we all take the stage, I'm going to hand it off to to Matt Ewalt for one last thing to say. Thank you so much, Matthew. As our panelists take their seats, uh, just a quick reminder of the format for tonight's discussion. We'll have approximately 45 minutes of moderated conversation, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of audience Q&A. We have two mic stands uh, right at the front of uh, the hall here for our in-person audience and those joining us online from around the state can submit their questions using our Q&A portal at texastribune.org slash ask. And a reminder to just let us know your first name, where you're from when you're submitting your question so that we can show where we're getting our questions from. Also invite everyone here in person to join us for a reception in the Lunar Room um, uh, uh, right around the corner from the check-in desk beginning immediately following the program. So let's get to our uh, opening uh, keynote. We're honored to have Representative Mary Gonzalez, Democrat of Clint, Representative Gary Van Dever, Republican from New Boston, and Representative Drew Darby, Republican from San Angelo. With that, I turn the program over to Texas Tribune Editor-in-Chief, Matthew Watkins. All right. 
Thank you, Matt, and thank you to all uh, to all of you for being here. I'm really appreciative Ada, and looking forward to this conversation. Um, as mentioned, you know, this is a conversation about the upcoming legislative session, where, of course, there are going to be many issues that impact uh, rural Texans and uh, the communities that you all represent. Uh, but I want to first talk a little bit about just the makeup of the legislature and what's different coming in this year. Of course, um, you all know, and, and many of you know as well, you know, one of the big fights of the last session was over school vouchers, um, education savings accounts, and things like that. Um, those measures did not pass. Um, last year, uh, in large part because of opposition um, from, from many rural Texans. And then there was a big push to um, remove many of those rural Texans from the legislature, a push that was um, not successful for the people on this stage, but was successful in a lot of different other areas. And so we are looking at a session where folks like Ernest Bales, Dwayne Burns, Justin Holland, Kyle Cassell, John Kimple, Andrew Murr, Four Price, Glenn Rogers, Hugh Shine, Reggie Smith, Ed Thompson will all not be in the Capitol next year. Not all because they lost elections, some because they chose to retire. But nonetheless, what we are seeing is there is going to be a lot less experience in the rural delegation next year, a lot fewer voices who were speaking for rural Texas um, uh, in, in recent years. And I wonder, and I'll start here with you, Representative. Um, what is the impact of that going to be beyond the voucher issue? We can talk about that, but I, but I, I want to talk more about just rural representation in the Capitol. Yeah, well, thank you, and, and thank you for allowing me to be here and be a part of this. Uh, it's always a, a, a pleasure to join you guys um, and to join my colleagues here on the stage. Um, yeah, there's no doubt that, you know, this session is going to be different. It, it's going to look different. We, we lost some really good members. We lost some, a lot of experience. Um, we lost some members who truly wanted to represent their districts, represent rural Texas. So yeah, voucher fight or no voucher fight, uh, what we have seen is, is really unfortunate for rural Texas. And, and we will, it's going to be important that we work together, uh, you know, across uh, political lines or, or other lines, you know, it, it, and I have a hard time sometimes explaining to my constituents back home that so many of our battles are not between Democrats and Republicans, they're between rural and urban. And, and to represent rural Texas today is difficult, and it's becoming more and more difficult. But, but yes, I, I believe this next session is, is going to be a challenge, but I believe there's some opportunities there as well. And I, I have confidence in my colleagues, and we, uh, we're going to come together and hopefully do some good things for rural Texas. Representative Darby, how do you feel it will be different this time around? Well, I agree with my colleagues and certainly enjoy always been on the stage with Mary and, and Gary. Uh, they are uh, not only colleagues, they're friends. And um, uh, forget about the political divisions. Um, as Gary said, it's not about R's and D's. It's about urban and, and rural. I will tell you that there are 17 state representatives that represent two-thirds of the land mass of Texas. That is all the land lying west of I-35. There's 17 of us that represent that area. Uh, of course, El Paso is, is a state in and of, of itself. But, uh, but so 17 of us. Well, when you look at Harris County alone, that's 25. So if we can't band together as ruralists and talk about water, talk about health care, talk about roads, talk about jobs, talk about public education, then, then we're lost. And so the, the members that are not coming back, uh, those members uh, had expertise in a lot of different areas than just public education supporters. Um, for Price, healthcare, uh, Justin Holland, Dwayne Burns, Chairman House Ag. Uh, there are a lot of rural members that had many years of experience advocating for rural issues that are no longer going to be uh, able to do that. And so hopefully the new folks can realize that uh, you got to put the campaign behind. You've elected. Congratulations. Now that the real work begins, you've got to begin the task of governance. That's a whole lot more difficult than campaigning. And, and hopefully they'll get 
oriented and situated and figure that out. If they don't figure it out, they won't stay. You either figure it out, how to be relevant back home, or you don't stay. So I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a challenge. Uh, we haven't given up on anything. <laughs> we're, there's still a lot of fight left in us. And uh, so we're, we're, we're looking forward to the, uh, the discussions to come. Representative Gonzalez, the, um, both members up here uh, beside you both mentioned it's not always Democrat versus Republican. It's, it's sometimes urban versus rural or, or, or something else. I can attest from just, you know, standing with y'all backstage that there's, there's definitely a bond, a spirit of co co collaboration uh, between y'all. Do you think or do you have any worry about being able to build those kinds of relationships with the folks coming in? First of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. Like my colleagues mentioned, or my friends mentioned, it's just an honor just to be with this group. Like, I love Drew Darby. He's a beautiful mentor to me. And, you know, Gary is a person I call when I'm watching every single rodeo. Uh, so, you know, um, but if the question is, am I worried about next session and relationships? I think one thing that I've learned is just being kind and polite in this, in this world just gets you a really long way. And so I'm not worried about trying to build those relationships. What I am worried about is what you alluded to earlier. Losing such a strong group of members is going to impact Texas. And I don't think that we should, we should be naive about that. Um, like you know, Chairman Darby said, losing someone like a Fora Price or a Dwayne Burns or a Chairman Kemple, I mean, these are legends that we ha are no longer going to have on the floor. And so um, really I'm a little bit concerned about what happens without some of those voices. So you mentioned, you said, you know, not, not giving up on anything yet. Is that, a, is that a reference to the voucher bill? I mean, tell me what you think about that dynamic on that particular issue, because the supporters of that bill seem pretty confident coming in into the session. Well, I mean, clearly the, the, the numbers have changed, uh, but we still have a, a, a Texas that depends heavily as our primary resource, and that's our public schools. Uh, are there challenges with public education? Yes. Uh, but in the end, each of the 150 members of the Texas House represents a vast community of kiddos that go to public schools, parents that send them to public schools, communities that, especially rural communities, the identity of our rural communities is through our public schools. Uh, you know, we have little uh, communities out in West Texas, whether it be Robert Lee or Bront. Where, where would those communities be without a public education, without a strong public education that mamas are willing to send their kids to learn at the, that public school? So. When I look out at the 150 members, yes, there were uh, some members who took the pledge. They said, uh, we're going to give you a bunch of money if you will support an initiative like vouchers. And so they took the money, and they campaigned, and they beat some good members. And so they're, that bill is going to come due. And they're going to have to, at, at some point, do what they said they'd do, and that's support something that I think is very bad policy in this state. And so, are we able to um, are we able to use the existing relationships that each one of those members have back home with the public school students and faculty and administrators and parents in those communities that will reach out to those members and say, "Hey, wait a minute." wait a minute, you need to think about us. It's one thing creating a new entitlement. When we have a surplus and, and we're spending money around and we want to create another entitlement, but there's a whole lot different story if this state is not if successful in the budget. I served in 2011 when we had a $10 billion deficit. And when I say deficit, it means that we had to cut $5 billion out of public schools, public education. We've never restored the five billion, much less added anything to it. So I think if if this debate is going to go on in the next session, and we're going to talk about the long-term effects that a that a universal voucher program will have on this state, and hopefully we'll have parents back home, community leaders back home that will reach out to their elected representatives and said, 
It's one thing for you to make that Faustian bargain, but it's another thing you governing, and we expect you to represent the interests uh, that we have back home. And so maybe we can steer the conversation into, into, into a helpful area that, that uh, we can, we can um, kind of control the debate and, and perhaps an influence on what it eventually looks like. And of course, the, the impact of last session wasn't just whether or not that particular bill passed, but tied up with that bill was, as you mentioned, billions of dollars to support schools. I mean, we've heard a lot from school districts, particularly rural districts since then, about struggles that they have faced. Tell me a little bit about what you're hearing from the schools in your district right now and what they need going into the session, whether that has anything to do with vouchers or ESAs or, or not. Yeah, our, our public schools and rural schools in particular are, are really facing some tough times and having to make some really tough decisions. And, and unfortunately, <clears throat> we created that in the last session. Um, you know, we, uh, most of my schools have adopted a deficit budget this, this year, and they can only do that for so long, you know, and, and uh, we're going to begin to lose some really valuable programs. Uh, we're going to begin to lose some really valuable people out of our public schools and so um, you know and, and I, I, I am somewhat confident that we can get some additional funding to our public schools this session um, but you know it, it's uh, to be honest with you there's going to be some damage done at this point by the time we can get the money to them uh, there will be some some damage already done um, so we'll we'll see you know there's a uh, we don't even know what a bill looks like at this point. Uh, we don't know what, what will be in it. Uh, we certainly don't know what it, what it will look like by the time it goes through a committee process and then process on the floor. And I remind people, you know, uh, I mean, I, I can count. I, I know what happened in the election, and I know what the, what the vote looks like now. But I remind people that just because someone did not vote to strip the voucher out does not mean they supported that bill. And so had we allowed that bill to continue through that day and, and to be amended and discussed, we don't know what we would have ended with, and we don't know how many members would have voted for it or against it. So, um, again, there, there's a lot of this movie left to, to see, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Representative Gonzalez, we, we talked about the, the money that didn't come through to the schools last session and how some of that will have a lasting impact beyond this past year. We talked about the change in the makeup of the legislature. Was, that, was all this worth it? Should, should there have been more openness to compromise on, on the bill last session? So first of all, there is still $5 billion that is... Not a, that, it, that is being held back, right, that could be in our schools right now. So I think it's really important that there, there, well, there, is so, there was and is still an opportunity for that money to get to the schools. But it, is it worth it? Um, I think that's a question that we always struggle with when we make any big decision. Uh, but I will say, very similar to Chairman Darby, public schools are such the hub of all of our communities. It's more than just a school, it's a community center, it's where you get informed about healthcare programs or food programs or, I mean, just so many important things. And so um, if we know that ESAs, the domino effect, especially, especially universal ESAs, because I do think last session there was efforts to find a compromise. And then there was like the, the only, there was no compromise. It was, it has to be universal or nothing. And so, um, Knowing the harms of universal ESAs, I think I, I would still think a lot of people would still make the same decision um, just because there's just too much to risk. The, but it just would impact our schools, not only in the current moment, but 10 years from now. Look at Arizona, look at other states that are really struggling with, with their ESA program. And so um, I don't think it was a house that wasn't compromising. I think it was other people who weren't compromising who would only have a universal all-encompassing ESA. Okay, I want to I want to move on to a, another topic, which is water. Um, last legislative session, uh, the, the legislature 
came together in, in approving a, a billion dollars uh, with, with the support of voters uh, for, toward a Texas water fund. A um, billion dollars is a lot of money, but um, many have and will... Drop in the bucket. Well, it's there you go. Drop in the bucket. Exactly. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll read a stat to, to support this. The, in 2022, the state water plan recommended 2,440 water managed strategy products, projects in Texas over the next 50 years. The total cost of that estimated to be around $80 billion. So to use your phrase, a drop in the bucket. Um, what needs to be, what else do we need to think about? What can happen this session to address this, this kind of looming crisis in the state? Well, you know, I live in an arid part of the state. Uh, we were cha water challenged, and, and I've been intimately familiar with the water challenges out in West Texas for a number of years, and, and almost everything we do is centered around water. Uh, we don't have a lot of it, so where do we get it? How do we get it? Who do we get it from? How far do we have to transport it? What do we have to do from a conservation standpoint, reuse standpoint, wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment? We've got oil and gas uh, produce water issues. Um, clearly, oil and gas uses some uh, fresh water associated with it, but they have been very prudent in trying to use and reuse that water in the hydrological cycle. And so the legislature has been very proactive uh, in the last couple of sessions in incentivizing operators to take that uh, that produced water, that waste, that oil and gas waste that they're charged with the responsibility of of managing, taking that oil and gas waste and, and produce water and treating it to a level of reuse. Uh, we've made a lot of great strides in that process. We figured, we they have figured out uh, a lot of the, uh, the methodology, if you will, to treat it to a level of, of reuse. It's expensive. And so how do we incentivize them to spend the extra dollars to create it uh, uh, treat it to a level that we can reuse it back in agriculture or for municipal reuse. And so we worked through that. I passed a, a couple of pieces of legislation which um, ordered, if you will, uh, who owns that produced water after they treat it and retreat it. Uh, uh, you know, you've got a, some controversy about is that uh, property of the surface owner, for example. Uh, the surface owners own the groundwater beneath their land, and so if you have an oil and gas operator that takes that produced water off the lease premises and combines it with other produced water, who owns it? Uh, so we, we brought some order into that discussion, and so we've tried to create a, a, a legal and statutory framework that incentivizes oil and gas operators in particular, we're talking about produced water, that will spend the extra money to, to treat it to a level that we can use it. And when you're talking about West Texas, if you can reintroduce that back and grow alfalfa or cotton or, or we can treat it to another level and, and use it for municipal uh, purposes or industrial purposes, that's a, that's a big, huge advantage. And we've got to create as a state a, a water market in order to incentivize that private investment. And I think this will be a session that we're going to invest more than the one billion dollars. Uh, Senator Perry, for example, from Lubbock, has really taken this issue on, and and we've got a lot of very uh, important pieces of legislation we're going to be working on with regard to creating that water market that will incentivize uh, private uh, development in order to make that happen. Yeah, one of the uh, we we actually invited Senator Perry to be here, and the, and he was uh, very open and interested in coming. But the reason he couldn't was because he's traveling around the state right now, really trying to build up support for this issue. And um, through conversation with him and reading what he has said elsewhere, I think he he's worried about the political will to spend the money that it takes to to meet the water needs um, in this state. Do you do you share that worry? Do you think that will is there? Well, you know, I think when we, at some point, when enough people understand the, you know, we, without water, we cease to live. You know, it, it's not as though we can't drive our cars and, you know, go where we want to go. We, we need it to live. And I, I, I think we've always had, and let me, let me preface this by saying, 
the part of the world, I, the part of the state I live in, we have water. <laughs> uh, we face another challenge, though. Our challenge is the urban areas want the water, and in order to get it, they want to build an 80,000-acre reservoir that would take out prime hardwood timber and through eminent domain, take away family farms that have been in families for generations. And so, again, rural, you know, a uh, rural perspective here. Um, but, but to your question, yes, I, I, I think people are beginning to understand the, how precious water is, how, how much in short supply water is in the state of Texas. And we can't just continue to assume we're going to be okay because Texas is growing at a rate we can't sustain it if we don't identify some additional resources for water. I, I love what Senator Perry is doing. Um, you know, our neighbors to the, my neighbor to the north, Arkansas, has an abundant supply of water. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't, I, I think we're going to be looking at possibly purchasing that and, you know, again, transporting it is, is a challenge, but, you know, we, we find ways to transport everything else we, we want to transport. So uh, I think there are some options out there, but again, I, I, I agree uh, with Chairman Darby. I, I, think, I think this session we are going to have to take a serious look, and I think, I think the political will is there. I, I, I believe we recognize that we cannot sustain the growth in Texas uh, without identifying water uh, resources and, and getting them in the pipeline. Can I ask you, this, this, we came up with, the uh, again, a kind of question of urban versus rural interests, right? And there are often conflicting issues there. Um, Y'all have already talked about the kind of level of co cooperation among rural members, but how do you... How hard is it to make that case to the more urban and suburban members in the in the capital to, to think about the rural interests and how how those interests affect the lives of their constituents as well? Um, you know, I'm a rural Democrat. I call myself a dying breed. Um, I, my dad, you know, cowboy raised me, and he's a rural Republican. And so I think what's been really beautiful is that we've had these bipartisan conversations about agriculture that has helped me think about how I want to frame it. I live in El Paso I County, even though I live in the more rural part, and so I'm always having these conversations about what happens 20 years from now if we're not producing our own food and fiber. And I think, again, like kind of what Gary was talking about, about people can take things for granted, like water, I think people also take for granted where food and fiber comes from, and how it not only is it important for us to eat and clothe ourselves, but it's also a national security issue. It's also an economic issue. It's a, there's a domino effect here that, and so to my urban colleagues, I do genuinely think they want to be supportive of rural Texas or agriculture, um, and I think sometimes they don't know how to do that, and I think that's where our conversations, our backgrounds are really, really important, but I also think what I, what I do worry about is sometimes I get sad that pe people would make the assumption that rural means Republican and um, urban means Democrat. And I don't think that, like, I know that's not the truth, right? And I think it's dangerous for us to politicize geography. I think that we should have Republicans and Democrats both in urban, suburban, and rural settings so we can have a more dynamic support of rural issues. And so... Um, I'm really happy that I feel that I can be a bridge a lot of times between urban members who maybe don't understand. I, I have a colleague who I love very much who came to my district and that day there happened to be a bull auction that I had to go to and this person uh, was like, oh, I didn't know cows were different colors. And I was just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay, we're going to have this. Or, you know, I, I have longhorn cattle. I, I, and, um, you know, longhorn cattle, you know, even the, you know, the heifers or um, still have horns. And it's just the questions that I get are just like, what? Like female cows have horns? And I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> but again, you know, happy that I get to play a role in creating education and awareness because I think that most people do want to support. And so helping get them to a place where the issues make sense and the policies make sense is really, is really important for us. 
I will tell you this. That I, I tell people, uh, you choose to live in a city, okay? Mm -hmm. The last time I checked, they don't grow beef cattle at the back of the HEB here in San Antonio. <laughs> they don't grow cotton in the back of the men's warehouse in Dallas, Texas. They don't generate electricity here in downtown San Antonio or Austin or Dallas. All our food, fiber, hide, hair, minerals come from rural Texas. And if you don't have people willing to work in rural Texas, make a living providing those resources to people who want to live in cities, who choose to live in cities, then several things have to happen. Number one, if you want us to live in rural Texas and provide those resources for you so you can choose to live in a city, then you're going to have to leave us some water. You're going to have to give us some road dollars that allow commerce to go from rural Texas back to cities. You're going to have to give us health care. Mama's not going to want to live in a community that doesn't have an adequate health care delivery system. You're going to have to give us some education dollars. They're not going to want to live there if we don't have a strong public school. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to give us good jobs on the farm or, or working to make sure those minerals and resources travel to, to urban Texas. So you just can't hog all that stuff. You gotta leave us with a little bit so you can live in that city. And that's the message that we, we deliver day in and day out. If you want us to live out here, and we choose to live out here, we wanna live out here, but we're going to have to have some resources to live out here. And so when we talk about 911, next generation, health care, people are dying. If people live in cities, they're worried about an extra 10 minutes of commute time. Really? People are dying. There's, there's a stretch of highway between Sterling City and, or in Glasscock County uh, going to Midland. It's the most fatalities of any stretch of road in the state. People who live in the city are worried about congestion. I worry about survivability every time I travel down those roads. There are intersections in oil and gas country that a four-way stop, it takes you an hour and a half to get through that intersection. And so, you know, my, my patience level <laughs> Sometimes is uh, exceeded, uh, and they're and again they want to one exchange on I-35. I could build I-27 Ports to Plains corridor from Laredo, Texas, to Canada. The portion that comes through Texas, I can build that whole thing for one interchange over I-35, and take all that traffic or a lot of that traffic off of I-35. But but you know to convince policymakers to invest in rural Texas so that their life can be better. Matthew, that's the challenge. So, so let me ask, um, I, I always like to ask in, in panels like this, the, the magic wand question, right? Like if you had a magic wand and could make one thing happen next session, get that buy-in for either your district or for rural Texas as a whole, what would you use that on? What, what would that, that need be? I'll, I'll kind of go down the line and ask, ask each of you all that question. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's a tough one. And, and really, I, I think, you know, I think that magic wand would do just what Drew just described. I mean, it's not one thing. It's not, well, our, our rural schools are important. Let's, you know, let's try to kill vouchers or whatever, you know. That's a piece of it. But, Water, you know, is, is not all of it. Uh, roads, health care, you know, uh, everything that that uh, I think people who live in urban areas, and I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, but I think people who live in ur urban areas, it's just always been there, and they just take it for granted that it's always going to be there. You know, we mentioned earlier, you know, about the the political will to do something about water well when you you know we've always in this country when we turn that tap we get water and so we just take it for granted and and I think if I if I had that wand I, I, I believe I would I would want to 
uh, do just what Drew just described and, and have urban Texas realize that it's in our best interest to have a strong rural Texas because without a strong rural Texas, Texas, <laughs> you know, ceases to become the Texas we all love. Well, I'm glad I didn't go first because my first instincts are things that would get me in a lot of trouble on Twitter. You, you can so, say that. Oh, no, no. I, my staff would, like, murder me, so no. But um, I guess, and this is going to sound a little bit utopian, but since I have a magic wand, I'm just going to go for it. I've been in the legislature now. I'm going into my seventh term, so nearly 13 years. Can you believe it's been that long, Chairman? I mean, I'm getting so old up here. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and not that there was like a good old days in the legislature, but I do worry about the, some of the conversations that, that distract from the good governance. Um, I, I think that I want us to have a strong and functioning democracy. I want us to have a fair and balanced process and system. And so right now there are so many, so many things pulling either the House apart or the legislature apart or, I mean, just so many, it's even hard to think about how good policy makes it through. And there are so many things that we need right now, like, you know, it's been said multiple times on the stage, whether it's healthcare, roads, water, education. And so none of this happens without good statespeople who are willing to lead in a way that doesn't put politics before the people of Texas. And I think right now, with so many things playing with what's happening, it just really does concern me that that environment won't exist to get things done. So my magic wand is a chamber or a legislature full of states people who are willing to take risks, willing to listen, willing to put policy over politics. And I'm so lucky that these two men on the stage are those type of people. So basically, I just want a legislature full of like these guys. Um, and, well, and women, <laughs> um, it's because I think that that's what our state needs right now. I, I will say one thing that worries me for rural Texas, and I'm going to say something really controversial, is like this Democratic chairs conversation. And why does it make me worried? Not necessarily because of Democratic chairs, but before rural Texas the most. Because at some point in Texas's future, there will be a Democratic majority. I know November's election results doesn't make it seem like it's anywhere possible, but at some point there will. And if we start instituting only the majority party gets to have chairs, well, with so few Democrats who are rural, there will be no rural chair people in the future if we do not have representation at all levels. And so I'm, um, again, that's my, ma my magical wish. Well, thank you. And, uh, Matthew, it's an interesting question because my wife would never give me a magic wand. <laughs> um, you know, she, she doesn't trust me with a magic wand. Um, I will tell you that I deal in the real world. It's hard to be fanciful. And so it's an interesting question and one I don't, I don't allow myself to, to go down that rabbit hole much. But uh, to Mary's point, and I agree with it, uh, we have 150 members of the Texas House. Each one of us represents more or less about 195,000 people. And those 195,000 people, yes, there are Republicans. Yes, there are Democrats. There's independents, libertarians, people who could care less about politics. There's old people, young people, disabled people. There's children. All of those people, to Gary's point, when they walk to the tap, they, t they turn on the tap, and that single mom trying to work two jobs to raise her family depend upon people like Gary and Mary and myself to make sure that there's a resource there for them to tap into. And so I don't, it's easy to represent the loud partisan person who invades our world all the time. Um, but it's harder to think about the people that you represent back home. And so I know these folks do, and I do. We try to, that's who I try to focus on, is, is the 195,000 people that live and work in the Concho Valley, in my case, 
10 counties out in rural Texas. Um, and they're, they're looking to me for policy decisions that make their lives better. And so teeing off what Mary said, if we could have a, a, a real world in which we sat down and we talked honestly about real issues that affect people's lives, then I would be most grateful and happy. But we'd never do that. We never get the chance to do that because social media has co-opted the discussion. People are more concerned about the next Twitter tweet or Facebook post. I've, I've had members that I have a lot of faith in. So when I go up to them and say, well, why did you vote that way? Well, I just don't want an opponent at the next election. Or I don't want uh, this protagonist back home uh, blasting me for voting that way. So instead of voting what's good policy for Texans and the people back home, they're, they're responding to social media pressure and, and pressure of the loudest partisans back home as opposed to doing focusing on what the future of this state is. I, I, I'm privileged. I have five children, and we have, um, we have 12 grandchildren now, Mary. And so... You know, decisions that I make in the legislature, I, I will live, hopefully, through part of those decisions. Uh, but I'm voting for my children and my grandchildren. That's what I, the Texan that's going to, Texas that's going to exist in the year 2035. We, we have 31 million, Gary, today, and we're going to have 40 million in 2035. Well, what are they going to drink? Where are they going to work? How are they going to get educated? All of those decisions we have to make. And so in, the, in this noise that we call a session that begins in January and in, in the end of May, hopefully, that'll be, there's no such thing as a special session. They're all bad sessions. Uh, but um, so hopefully we can talk about those things and not the flavor of the month, what's the latest social engineering issue that we've got to take up two or three days talking about. You know, w w when we talk about rural issues, a lot of the question comes down to investment and how much will is there to invest money. It's It's been interesting to see in the aftermath of the election last week um, with the election of Donald Trump, the election of someone whose um, policies on the border and immigration align more with the, the Republican Party in Texas. Um, in, in a press conference the day after the election, Governor Abbott talked about um, the seemed to be open to the possibility of maybe scaling back some of the state investment on border security and, and, and things like that and, and redirecting that money in some other ways. In an interview with WFAA over the weekend, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said similar things as well. This has obviously been a very important issue to the Republican Party uh, during the Biden administration. I wonder whether you think you know, A, the Republicans on the stage would agree with the idea of possibly doing that and whether y'all think that's an, whether you agree or not, whether you think it's a realistic possibility to see some of that money that's been directed toward the border to some be spent on some of these other issues uh, in, in the near future. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, this, this is one of those areas where I tread lightly because of who's sitting to my left. <laughs> Uh, we, we, you know, we agree on a lot of things, and then there are some things we don't talk about. And so, <laughs> but, um, but, but, when we when we talk about securing the border, um, I, I, you know, I I do believe that the money we've spent down there, uh, you know, I don't know that that we've gotten a great bang for our buck on some of it. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I don't know that the money has been used to the best, you know, uh, put to the best use down there. But, but ultimately, I have supported appropriating dollars to be spent to secure our southern border because I think it's important that we secure that southern border. And uh, it has certainly gotten a lot of national attention in this last campaign, uh, the presidential campaign. Uh, our states, our U.S. Senate campaign, uh, you know, we've seen it really get a, get a lot of attention. And you poll any, anywhere in Texas and, and 
border security polls, number one, wherever you are. So, um, but I, I do believe that Texas should expect to be able to scale back. I believe Texas should, be able, should expect to be repaid what we've spent on that border. Uh, you know, I, I tell, you know, my house is about eight miles from Arkansas, okay? You can probably tell by the way I speak that uh, uh, I'm, I'm close to Arkansas. Close that border. Close uh, that border. So I've got the northern border taken care of. If you guys would just take, <laughs> take care of it. No. Um, but <laughs> we, uh, I tell my friends in Arkansas, you guys are fortunate. You don't have a border you have to secure. Your state dollars are going for education and going for roads and going for infrastructure. You don't have to, be, you don't have to worry about a, a, the southern border. In Texas, we do. And so uh, when there has been uh, what we consider to be a lack of support from our federal government to secure that border, Texas has stepped up. I, I believe uh, it is time for us to scale that back, start using those resources for uh, infrastructure and needs within our state, and I believe we need to, to send, the, the, send Congress a, a bill for the money we spent. I want to let you answer this, but really quickly, I just want to say, too, um, we have a couple minutes for questions, too, from the audience, and, and while uh, the representative answers, if anyone has a question they would like to answer or ask, we have two microphones up here. Uh, feel free to come line up, and we will go to you after this. Okay, go ahead. I love that Gary answered first. I love it. <laughs> um, so I'll say a couple of things. One is we spend $14 billion on border security right now. $14 billion is the entire state budget of New Mexico. So do I wish that we could scale it back because I do think there's inefficiencies and I don't think it's necessary, I don't think it's ever been necessary? Yes. Do I worry that politically we maybe won't be able to? Because here's my fear. Even if you have permission from the governor, lieutenant governor, all the powers that be, the mailer will still read, Gary Van Dever decreased border security funding from last session. And so even if there is now some free, like freedom to do some of that scaling back, the problem with politics is the problem with politics. But I will also say one really important thing. As someone who lives 0.5 miles from the Mexican border, like my house is right, my little farm, and then right there is a border wall. I, of course, want our borders to be safe because it's my constituents who live there. I also think there is a misinformation campaign about what's happening on the border that creates this narrative that, there, that it is chaos and that it is dangerous and that it is awful. And if you come to my community, which I invite everybody to do, that is just not the reality. And again, this is a political rhetoric versus um, what's actually happening. I'm happy to spend money to keep my community safe. I'm not happy to waste money um, that could be appropriated to more urgent needs of our state just because it is the moment of the political rhetoric. And so I, I just really, I guess for me, the border conversation is harder because this is my home. And I think that the idea that other legislators, want, le other legislators want my home to be more safe than I do for my people is just not, like, I'm not voting against border security money because I don't want my people to be safe. I'm voting against border security money because it's not being used efficiently or effectively, and I have concerns about that. And so I, I, I am eager to continue to represent the border and share the true story of what's happening there. Well, I'm, I'm just expecting a $14 billion check in the mail. I mean, I'm, I believe in the tooth fairy, and, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm fully expecting $14 billion. Uh, I'm absolutely positive our congressional delegation is going to present a bill to the new administration. They're going to write that check. Right. <laughs> Uh, thanks, y'all, for being here. I uh, want to commend all of y'all. Uh, we touched briefly on public education. My question is related to higher education. All of y'all, for your support of uh, House Bill 8 last session, in particular, uh, Representative Van Dever's leadership authoring that bill, uh, uh, changing the way that the state finances our community college system. I'd love to just hear from each of you about the relationships that each of you have with your local community colleges and the role that you see them playing in this entire conversation of continuing to develop the economies of rural Texas. 
Well, I'm going to go first because I am, I am wonderfully surprised with this campus. This is a beautiful campus, beautiful theater here, uh, most welcome host. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of higher education. My first bill in the legislature back in 2007 was moving Angelo State University out of the Texas State system into the Texas Tech system because geographically, culturally, um, economically, we were more t closely tied with Texas Tech than we were with Texas State. And so uh, ever since that point, I have been hugely supportive of not only higher education, but certainly community colleges, the new funding uh, formula, I think has worked dramatically and we need to continue that uh, for our 50 community colleges. And so uh, Mary is uh, very instrumental in the appropriation process and, and we'll look to Mary for continued support of, uh, of our community colleges and for higher education. But uh, uh, it's a, again, it, uh, we can talk about roads and water and and public education, but we've got to talk about higher education too. It's infrastructure we have to invest in. It's never, it's never a happy prospect, but we have to. We have aging facilities. Um, we're having to rethink uh, higher education. Is it, it's no longer about bricks and mortar. It's about how do we get these kids and give them the skills necessary uh, to compete on the world market. So thank you for the question. I love this question for one reason. It allows me to brag, because he's the most humble human being in the history of the world, but Gary Van Deaver is a badass. Let me tell you why. He is so great. Be oh, he <laughs> he's like, why <laughs> is this happening to me? Uh, he is so great because not only was he part of the Community College Finance Commission, where he was instrumental in creating the policy, then he's a badass because he bought the bill to the floor. And guess what? In a t we, we were so nervous about all the potential amendments and all the way the conversation could go. And this guy, this guy right here, no amendments, passed, perfect, like literally th three minutes, and it was a work of art, and it really was because of his leadership and people's trust in him as an education leader. And so I just, so I love this question because you don't see big bills like that passed without debate or trying to be politicized in other ways. And it was the respect that this man has on the floor that allowed for it to happen in the way it happened and our community colleges are now benefiting. And so to answer your question, I love my community college. It's the largest educator of higher education in my community. And we are so blessed to have Dr. Serrata, who was also on the commission, help craft some of these public policies. But um, as someone who is a professor still in higher education, I genuinely think that that is a conversation that is now becoming too politicized and I worry about the future of higher ed in Texas as we um, rapidly are transforming our schools in a way that I think we will have negative consequences. Yeah, um, <laughs> gee, <laughs> I'm not sure what I should say after that. Um, badass, okay, you got a new nickname, yeah. Gary. <laughs> I'm, I'm Representative glad it's, Badass. I'm glad it's being recorded, I, I, I'll, I'll have that. Um, no, the, the House Bill 8 was, uh, I mean, it was a teamwork all the way through, and, and it, it began uh, really in the, in the commission we had that, that spent a year, year and a half studying uh, community college finance, and, and so, you know, I, I was very fortunate that I got to put my name on the bill as the author, but um, that bill was the result of a lot of work from a lot of people, but, but one thing that really opened my eyes and really, before we even had the commission, the thing that really caused me to to hone in on that. Number one, I, I'm a product of community college. Uh, I, I, I attended Parish Junior College out of, out of high school uh, before going on to get a degree. But um, I realized Parish Junior College that, that I attended and, and several other, at least about 10 of our 50 community colleges across the state, if we didn't do something and do it quickly and do something significantly, they were going away. It, it, we were to that point. And when you look around at the, and most of them, I guess all of them are probably in rural areas. When you look at where these community colleges are in rural areas, there is no one to take their place should they go away. We have an educational desert, a higher education desert in those areas. And so, uh, I, again, I was fortunate to be able to work on that bill, but uh, the work that was done, I think, was phenomenal. And, 
And I, as I said when I laid that bill out, I believe that funding, that, that piece of legislation will be transformational, not just for us today, but for generations. And it's going to bring generational change to Texans. And when we get to do that in, in, the, in the legislature, man, that, you know, that makes that $600 a month seem worth it. So, you know. <laughs> So we're going to try to get to uh, a few questions here in the few minutes we have. I'm going to ask a question from online, then we'll have this gentleman over here ask a question, then we'll get to two questions over here. Um, question from online. Those states that have refused federal dollars to expand Medicaid coverage have experienced a much greater loss of small clinics in rural areas than those states that did expand Medicaid coverage. Please discuss why this isn't a significant part of the discussion about rural health care. This doesn't seem to be a rural versus urban issue. Well, you know, one of the challenges, one of the pillars of rural Texas is having a health care delivery system. Uh, currently, today, there are 28 counties in Texas that you cannot deliver a baby. Let that sink in, folks. In 2024, there are 28 counties in Texas where you can't deliver a baby. And so the challenge is, I, I've had three meetings this in the last two months with rural hospitals that are going under. They cannot get the reimbursement rates that they need to survive. And so when they go under, it's like Gary's comment, when they go under, there's no, not going to be anybody to take their place. Well, if you can't, if you can't have access to health care, then people are not going to live there. And, and so all these city folks that like to eat, like to wear clothes, like to drive their cars, I mean, if we don't have folks willing to live in a, in a medical desert, then nobody's going to deliver those to them. Let's go to this question over here. Thank you all for being here tonight. I am one of those city folks who likes to eat, and I like to drive my F-250 around the city, but I also like to do that when I go to the ranch or when I go to South Texas. And I am very big into rural issues. That's a lot of the work I do. And so I want to talk to you all about water policy. I heard a lot about urban versus rural, and certainly San Antonio is a big culprit of taking water from other areas in the state of Texas. But there's a policy issue here when it comes to rural areas and rural municipalities that are taking water from those same pools of water. So what is the appropriate policy when it comes to prioritizing the use of water, people versus agriculture? How do you ensure that water that is used for historical agricultural purposes is not diverted for the needs of individuals, whether they're in big cities like San Antonio or whether they're in smaller municipalities like San Angelo? Well, okay, I'll wade into that. Uh, first of all, I think San Antonio, it, it, it's not been perfect. But with the authority that they created, and they recognize the extent of the aquifer extending into Uvalde and, and parts west, um, they've recognized that that's the recharge area. And so they worked with uh, farmers in Uvalde in particular. I, we have, uh, we're familiar with uh, in Real County along the Frio River. And, um, and so my wife's family was part of a, historic ranch there for a number of years. And so we have seen how San Antonio has used, uh, has acquired conservation areas, bought water rights in that area, still allowed the surface to use some portion of that water, but again, dedicated the, most of the groundwater for ultimate flow back to the city of San Antonio. So where you have a defined aquifer extent then the way San Antonio has managed that resource, I think, is, is something to be learned from. Uh, but it is a balance. And to Gary's point, when, when you talk, talk about the Marvin Nichols Reservoir, uh, uh, the city of Dallas and Fort Worth, there's a lot of mouths and there's a lot of voters in that area. But they want to come take a lot of acreage out of production 
And so how we balance that, I, I, this issue, strangely, I encountered in 2007 when I first came into the legislature. This, the Marvin Nichols Reservoir has been going on since that time, so it's not an issue that's gone away. We just have, I'm a big private property rights guy. I, I, I believe uh, land ownership is one of the most sacrosanct ideas in this state. Uh, but again, it's a balancing, but when you have political decisions being made, and ultimately there's probably gonna be a political decision made with regard to the Marvin Nichols Reservoir, and so I don't have a real answer to your question. That is something we struggle with because, again, when you look at the number of state representatives who represent the Metroplex area and you rep we look at, what, four or five state reps that represent all that kind of area in East Texas that would be affected, that's no contest. It's no contest unless Gary's able to marshal guys like me who believe and Mary, they believe in private property rights and able to help them defend uh, that concept. So, yeah, I don't it, know, that's the best I can do for an answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> if I can just jump in real quickly too, and I, I, I agree with, with what Drew has said, but it just seems to me, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not a water rights guy, we have some folks in the legislature, we lost one, couple of sessions ago that was that knew <laughs> all of this and we we miss him greatly but um, you know this is really not my wheelhouse but as someone who grew up on a family farm and who continues to raise cattle and 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 be involved in agriculture you know we can't we can't keep taking land out of production we can't keep killing the cow that gives the milk <laughs> you know we we have to and you you mentioned you know how do we how do we allow these agricultural entities to continue to have the water that they've historically had? I think whatever we do, I think our, our policy has to recognize the importance of, of having water for production to enjoy all the things we've been talking about tonight. And that's why I'm really intrigued with this idea of buying water out of state for these municipalities, for industry, you know, for, for those uses because then that, that does lessen the, the pressure on rural Texas and, and the water supplies in rural Texas. All right, I think we have time for, is that one last, but we're, we've already kind of blown past our time, so let's go, let's aim for a quick answer. Okay, can you all hear me? Hi, um, thank you for being here tonight. This question could be answered by any of you, but it touches on something that Representative Darby has brought up a couple of times, and that's the role of um, healthcare and our relationships between rural and suburban and urban Texas. And in October, Texas Tribune had a wonderful article outlining how the Texas abortion bans have impacted the maternal health care system throughout Texas. Um, <clears throat> Since those abortion bans have taken place, more doctors are, are considering leaving or retiring early while fewer medical students are applying to obstetrics and gynecology residencies in Texas. And in some of the, the areas that are hit the hardest, of course, are rural Texas. 45% um, of Texas uh, counties are rural, um, are maternal health care deserts. Um, and by 2030, you had mentioned 2035, but by, by 2030, Texas is ex expected to have 15% OBGYNs than is needed to help up, uh, keep up with demand. So my question is, how do you see your roles as rural representatives in reversing these devastating maternal health um, trends that will impact rural um, women and families hardest? Thank you. Um, first, thank you for bringing up a really important issue. We are in El Paso County blessed to have Texas Tech Medical School, but one of the things I hear from medical students themselves is the concern of how do they get even the teaching tools that they need in order to serve women who need healthcare access, right? So um, obviously, I'm the person on the stage who has been very against the abortion bans, not only because of all the things you listed, right, but, but so many other reasons, but here's what we do know. Um, we are, women are dying, and 
I guess we could choose to not know that fact, or we can choose to create public policy that makes sure that women have health care access, all the ways that all the ways they may, that they may need it, the right, all the doctors, everything that they need. And right now, we're not doing that, and we're failing. And so, again, I hope that we are states people going into this session and the sessions after to address serious crises that do exist in the state. Um, but thank you for bringing up such an important issue, and I can see your passion, and we need more people like you fighting the good fight. Okay, thank you so much for the audience for the questions, and thank you so much for these three representatives for being here. It's a great conversation.